<laughs> well, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us for this morning's event on Future Vertical Lift, uh, Forging a New Paradigm. I'm going to talk very briefly at the start because we have a large and all-star uh, panel uh, to talk to you. So just a few comments. I'll start as we always do with the security announcement. Uh, we have a nice secure facility here, but if anything were to happen during this morning's event, uh, I will be your security officer and we'll give you further guidance and in honor of today's uh, group, uh, we'll be medevaced out of the facility uh, by air. Uh, uh, no, in actuality, we'll exit uh, either out the front or the back, depending on uh, where we might need to go. Um, but we don't anticipate that. Uh, and I do also want to uh, begin, as always we do, uh, by acknowledging the fact that this event and, in fact, this whole series on Future Vertical Lift has been made possible by support from Textron Bell Helicopter. So uh, we really thank them for that support and making it possible for us to really delve into the Future Vertical Lift topic. Uh, and today's session, uh, I know that the title is a little broad, Forging a New Paradigm. That's uh, you know, what do we mean by that? Uh, we've, we've had, uh, as many of you know, a whole series of events looking at future vertical lift, looking at uh, commonality, looking at uh, industry relationships, looking at uh, the, the requirement set, uh, the Army's requirement set, the broader set of capabilities that the joint uh, team has uh, defined and spelled out. Uh, and so today's effort is really to take a, a step back and look at what really makes future vertical lift different, uh, what makes it different uh, in terms of uh, the, the approach to sustainability for uh, the platforms that are going to be part of the future vertical lift uh, set. Uh, what's, what's different about the acquisition environment this time around compared to previous uh, times when vertical lift was being acquired? Uh, what's different about the industry environment uh, that is going to uh, actually make this happen? Uh, bending metal, doing the design work, uh, uh, putting together mission systems for future vertical lift platforms. Uh, and then also, of course, critically, the mission environment that, uh, that these platforms are going to be operating in. So to hear more about those topics, uh, as I mentioned, we have an all-star panel. Uh, I'm going to introduce them uh, and, uh, in a row, and then we'll go to some uh, initial questions. Uh, to my left is uh, Colonel Rob Freeland, uh, who works at the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition and Technology and Logistics, uh, my old home. Um, and he's a specialist on uh, military rotorcraft. Uh, as you can tell from his uniform, he is a, a Marine Corps uh, pilot, Marine Corps officer, uh, and uh, has served in a, a variety of, of uh, really important positions, including uh, as a squadron commander uh, in operations. Uh, to his left is Keith Flail, who's the Vice President for Advanced Tilt Rotor Systems at Bell Helicopter, a part of Textron. He's the former vice president for global military business development at Bell, uh, and he is a West Point graduate, Army veteran, uh, and uh, unsurprisingly, an aviator as well. I think we think we have an all aviator panel. So, uh, to his left is Rich uh, Kucharavi, director of Future Vertical Lift business development at Sikorsky, a Lockheed Martin company. Uh, also, a U.S. Army veteran and an aviator, uh, served as the aviation division chief uh, on the G8. Uh, to his left is uh, Delta Burke, Avionics Lead, Future Vertical Lift, Harris Corporation, uh, and formerly Senior Manager at the Avionics Business Development at Northrop Grumman. Uh, he is a retired Marine Corps uh, officer and, uh, and former Requirements and Resource Officer at the Pentagon. Uh, to his left is uh, a retired Colonel Dave Schreck is Vice President and General Manager for Airborne Solutions, Rockwell Collins. Uh, he's the, also the former Vice President for Strategy and Mergers and Acquisitions at Rockwell Collins uh, and is an Air Force veteran of uh, 22 years service. And uh, down at the end, uh, holding up uh, the rear guard, Dave Dowling, uh, Director, Vertical Lift Capabilities, North Grumman, uh, uh, also a uh, former uh, Marine aviator. Uh, and I'm going to start here on, on my left with uh, Colonel Freeland and ask uh, Colonel if you could start us off by giving us uh, a little bit of an overview of the FVL vision as you see it from your uh, position in ATNL and also the work uh, that I know that you've been doing with your colleagues uh, on the joint team uh, to define that vision and uh, you know what's the desired end state and how it's how does it how do you see uh, the paradigm looking also with industry? 
Okay, I appreciate that, Andrew, and I appreciate this opportunity to have a public discourse about the shifting in the paradigms. Um, really, it's a question of how do you want to spend your money? Um, it's a question of how you want to spend it in the life cycle, uh, where you want to spend it in the life cycle, and what you want to get for that money. It has to do with the core reliability and maintainability of the systems that you want to see in the fleet, and what that allows the Joint Task Force Commander to do. And it has to do with the paradigm for the upgradability of the mission systems and survivability systems that go on these, uh, these aircraft. So really, I think sometimes it's helpful to place things in context. Um, if you look at the generations of rotorcraft, uh, go back to World War II, uh, and interestingly, we had in search and rescue aircraft World War II, and you see uh, those growing into Korea, you know, um, effective aircraft, um, maybe you can take them out of the sky with a well-placed rock, so uh, might not be uh, perfect for the application. We see going into the Vietnam War, uh, the uh, rapid uh, expanse of uh, Hueys and some of the lighter airframes that came through. General purpose airframes, effective in large numbers, maybe missing a few things from a survivability standpoint and maybe not the easiest to maintain. Uh, you start to see some specialization as you move out of uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, you start to see the Cobra coming in at the end of the Vietnam War, a specialized attack aircraft. Snap the line, step into um, into the 70s and 80s, and you start to see the H-60s and the H-64s, kind of uh, the next generation of that, that specialized airframe. You have very good utility, um, some uh, light transport aircraft, and very good attack aircraft, but you start getting toward the end of the edgewise flow, uh, very integrated systems, uh, highly proprietary uh, solutions, and a cost associated with having to upgrade those aircraft. Well, then you take a revolutionary step with the introduction of a tilt rotor, an operational tilt rotor with a V-22. The next step is putting all those things together, where you have this uh, revolutionary capability in a tilt rotor, you have the burgeoning capability of a pusher prop that starts to expand what you can do from an effectiveness standpoint from the capabilities of the airframe. You add to that then the investment in reliability and maintainability early in a program, something that oftentimes, because of the conditions of some of the decisions that are made over time with programs, that oftentimes we leave to the ONS phase, so the operation and support phase. So we have found and asked a lot of our money, a lot of the investment being required to kind of uh, fix some of the suitability concerns with airframes after they get into service. Let's shift that. If you get the investment up front into the reliability and maintainability so that you can then, or and then you also have a modularized open system approach, you are able to spend your money rapidly upgrading the uh, mission effectiveness and mission survivability gear that you can rapidly assimilate onto the aircraft. That's the paradigm we seek, the appropriate level of commonality and open systems approach and having the reliability and maintainability uh, taken care of up front. That gives you more logistically supportable aircraft and across the different services and more sustainable fleet uh, as you move down the road. That's the paradigm we see. Well, thank you. Um, Keith, I, I want to go next to you. And uh, I mentioned up front a little bit about the acquisition environment, and, uh, and the Colonel touched on this. Um, you know, we're in an era where Congress has been pushing to devolve more authority uh, to execute acquisition programs to lower levels, take out bureaucracy, uh, and also to do more use of prototyping and modular designs. These are kind of in the atmosphere that, that Future Vertical Lift is proceeding in. Uh, and in, in particular, in the case of Future Vertical Lift, prototyping has been a very notable element uh, of the path forward. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about uh, how does that kind of change the equation for future vertical lift? How does the prototyping aspect build into the program going forward? Well, I think the uh, uh, point to the joint multi-role uh, tech demonstrator phase that uh, several of us are, are executing right now, it's really uh, unprecedented when you look at the uh, risk reduction and how we're informing requirements for future vertical lift. So that, 
that uh, opportunity that government and industry have to capitalize on uh, as we move forward with future vertical lift, I think is huge, probably bigger than anything we've ever done. So you literally have hundreds of millions of dollars over and at least a five plus year head start on wherever the requirements uh, end up for what's what's required for future vertical lift. So leveraging that uh, that opportunity and that return on investment, again, uh, with all the industry partners that are participating in that, uh, for us with Bell, Team Valor, we have 11 other in investing teammates that are with us, all dedicated to and committed to burning down risk uh, for our future. So I think it's important, however, future vertical lift lays out that the appropriate credit, if you will, is, is applied for what have we done, what have we not done to, to not duplicate that and, and, and uh, perhaps enter deeper into the acquisition cycle uh, to get capability to warfighters faster. Because uh, at the end of the day, the, the threat is not uh, sitting still. They're continuing to evolve. Uh, you look at uh, multi-domain battle. You look at uh, all the things we have to do across the the warfighting functions, and uh, it is very difficult to go to the next generation of aircraft. When we uh, have, uh, DOD has their aircraft, they, they stay in the inventory for a very long time, and going to the next thing, and when it's appropriate to go to the next thing is always a difficult choice. Uh, but, the, but the one thing I think we do have with the JMR experience is uh, proving out a lot of these technologies, doing a lot of tech, uh, technology maturation and risk reduction. It's not a uh, TMRR per se, uh, and, and officially linked to future vertical lift, but certainly an opportunity that we can uh, we can capitalize on. Um, additionally, you, by doing this, uh, we have a, we're going to be uh, flying uh, our demonstrator um, this year, and that's just around the corner for us, and that gives the opportunity f as a flying test bed for additional risk reduction of what are the other technologies, what are the other things that we need to get after that we haven't done yet that uh, Colonel Freeland mentioned related to reliability and really, you know, gathering uh, some good uh, data and metrics on, on what, what we need to do next uh, to, to accelerate this process. Uh, lastly, the digital thread, when you look at all the products in terms of how we design and build aircraft, it fundamentally changes everything in terms of how we can do uh, DOD acquisition. The power of these tools uh, when, you, when you design the aircraft and you build the aircraft and the precision of how the parts come together and the reductions in, uh, in man hours to do it, what it means to have a central data source uh, that changes the way you do your technical publications, your training, your maintenance. Everyone is operating off of the same central data source. So when you talk the operation and support costs downstream, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of learning uh, that we've achieved in this joint multi-role phase that we definitely need to apply as we move forward. Uh, as an enterprise for future vertical lift. Thanks. Uh, I want to kind of follow that thread a little bit on this issue of the design and, and designing for future vertical lift and designing, you know, as the Colonel said, uh, for sustainability, for forward availability uh, in an open mission systems environment, which requires uh, designing in uh, standards that are common across industry. So, uh, Richard, if you could talk to us a little bit about that dynamic of designing for sustainability, designing for an open systems environment, uh, how do you see that uh, from where you sit? So the JMRTD is a great opportunity for us to explore you know, really two things, and that is the advanced air vehicle technologies, this, this idea that you can get you know, vehicles with these greater speeds and ranges, uh, payloads, um, and an opportunity with a clean sheet aircraft to design in some of these attributes that are vital, and I think sustainability is one of those areas. Uh, our experiences, and, and you know, Colonel Freeland traced it back well. I don't believe these early designs were put together with an eye toward uh, what the, the long term effect on uh, on the government would be with aircraft that required, you know, uh, uh, rather. Um, high bar uh, for, you know, inspections for time-based uh, time component replacement. Um, and we see, especially our warfighters who are deployed, that burden is tremendous and has got to be reduced. Um, it's especially critical that those considerations be brought into the design phase of the program. Uh, in order for us to do that, in order for us to get to the zero maintenance concept that we've heard discussed in the Department of Defense, these aircraft have got to be at the very beginning wired and plumbed, so to speak, to accept the, 
you know, the, the devices that are required, whether those are, you know, accelerometers, magnometers, um, temperature sensors. Secondly, we've got to be able to handle the data that comes off these aircraft, and we've got to be able to do data analytics and have the infrastructure set up. And so my concern is, in short, that those metrics are brought in and they become just as vital as the performance metrics that we're looking for in these aircraft in the design phase. And as we consider sizing the aircraft, as we consider developing those key performance parameters, what we're looking for in terms of the effect on reducing the maintenance burden, those, get, those have got to be early on considerations. And as we go into those trade studies, um, I, I believe strongly, I think all of industry believes strongly that that conversation needs to be happening now. Well, and, uh, I didn't mention it at the start, I probably should have, but uh, you know, we've built today's panel with a real focus on having, obviously, the, the two main primes, but also a range of folks who build mission systems, because uh, as the Colonel mentioned, the, the mission system aspect uh, on future vertical lift is critical. And um, Delta, I'll turn to you next. Uh, you know, in this environment that, that Richard was just describing, uh, that's a little bit different uh, and is creating new new requirements for data exchange, data uh, offloading, and data an analytics. Uh, you're in the business of building mission systems uh, and also communication systems, uh, critically when you talk about transferring data around. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on, with Future Vertical Lift, uh, how do you get the uh, up-to-date technology and keep up-to-date technology on a platform like the Future Vertical Lift platforms will be probably going to be in the inventory for a long time, uh, and, uh, and then do that in a way that's affordable and sustainable. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. I think uh, Richard kind of hit the nail on the head with design. It starts with the architectural design. There's multiple, I mean, really thousands of layers of design that go into uh, a program such as Future Vertical Lift, uh, even at the JMRTD level. So if you, uh, at, at certain design levels, they need to be compatible all the way up and down the entire structure. Uh, what To be able to effectively weave a new capability or uh, uh, a, a rapid capability into whatever platform it is, it's going to require um, what we call uh, loose coupling with high cohesion. Okay, it needs to be able to, uh, the open standards, okay, we're all familiar with FACE, um, and uh, the open standards concept, open radio architecture, et cetera. So having these standards defined and put in place, we've got MIL standards. The FAA does a phenomenal job uh, with their standards. You know, it took them 60, 70 years, uh, and Harris is fortunate enough to, to be one of the leading communications architectures for FAA, and they've learned along that. Um, you know, they have uh, DO1, you know, using DO178, D DO 254, the standards for software and hardware, um, all having those things in place at the beginning uh, with those loosely coupled ICDs uh, with the high cohesion is going to allow us to rapidly insert technology at, at any stage of the game. And we see that now. We'd love to be able to put uh, new capability into whether it's the V22 or the H1. Uh, on the Marine Corps side of the house, um, even tactical jets on the Air Force side of the house. But it's so difficult because those ICDs are just, they're, they're, the roadblocks just do not allow them to work seamlessly into the aircraft. So as we build the architecture and the design, as the JMRTD phase continues to move forward, as long as we could set those standards to where someone like Harris or Rockwell or Northrop can go in best of breed, what we call, and, uh, and be able to rapidly insert that capability that the warfighter needs. Uh, I think that's going to be uh, A, better for the warfighter, and B, I think it's going to have a cost advantage as well uh, because we know exactly the azimuth that we need to build to instead of, you know, shooting, uh, uh, sh you know, shooting in the dark trying to hopefully get the eye, you know, the uh, cohesion correctly. Thanks. Uh, follow up, I guess, kind of a similar question uh, for you, Dave, about 
uh, you know, I think Rockwell Collins always think avionics, uh, the, 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 all the systems that go into that, the displays, the, the radios, everything. How do you see that uh, a supplier uh, working at that end of the business can feed into this FVL acquisition approach uh, and ensure that the, the stuff that you're supplying is going to match up with the operations environment that this, these platforms are going to be operating in over an extended period of time? Thanks, Andrew. Uh, great, great question, and, and, and the dialogue is especially critical because I think, as was mentioned previously by several of the speakers, I, I think it's, it's critical that we are able to rapidly meet the threat out there. You know, I, I have a son who's an Air Force pilot, and, and I look at it you know, in terms of I want to think that he's got the, the best equipment to do the mission, whether it's the aircraft platform or the mission equipment packages. And that's really what I, I see FVL and JMR is doing for the, for the Army in the future vertical lift is it's starting to figure out from an innovative way to address that, that problem set uh, that we haven't really looked at before uh, as an industry or as a, as a government, as a DOD. So I think it's, it's critical that we all go forward and, you know, the, the Rockwells, the Northrops, the, the Harrises, we all have our packages. We have all our, our background and our experience, our, our competencies, and it's how we bring those together. I, I go back to my days in the Air Force, and uh, there was something that was very similar. It was, it was how, did, how did we try to meet an evolving threat, very rapidly evolving threat, and it was in the network operations uh, arena. And initially what they're saying was all the major commands needed to, they said, hey, we, we, we can't eat, do one each kinds of systems. We have to pull them all together into one network, have a standard, have an architecture that, that uh, Delta just talked about, and make sure that we could rapidly field capability to be able to, to meet a, a, a very rapid uh, and evolving threat. And that was very successful. It, there were some fits and starts, though, and, uh, and I think that whole technology area is a lot like the technology that we're talking about today. I'd also equate it to, you know, just taking a, a big step back. You know, you look at uh, professional teams. Look, look at the, the New England Patriots. How are they so successful? I know there may be a few Redskin fans <laughs> in the audience, but how are they so successful? It's because everybody knows their job. You know, there's a coach, there's a quarterback, there's a lineman. And I think that's what we're able to do. You know, Richard talked about getting data analytics on the platform. Do you want to have somebody that's just dabbling in data line analytics, or do you want to have somebody who's, who's done that? And I'm not even talking about, you know, the three companies here. There are a lot of small companies out there that are innovating the heck out of a lot of these areas. And I think that's what it allows us to do is pull that together. How we do the contracting, what the relationships are between the primes and the, and the, the suppliers, the mission equipment providers. Yeah, that's all going to get worked. I, I'm excited about the, the way that the, that the Army especially and DOD is starting to look at this because it really sees, I, I really see an opportunity to be able to pull things in to meet those threats a lot more rapidly. So we're on a good path. Great. Uh, David, uh, we've talked a little bit about, I, I think maybe I'm going to try and move us more towards maybe a few more specifics. Um, uh, so maybe you're the lucky winner here. But uh, in terms of the critical capabilities, uh, we've heard a lot about architecture. Uh, is there, do you see specific uh, critical capabilities for future vertical lift based on the mission environment that's going to be out there uh, that maybe people haven't been focused on or haven't been as much of a focus on prior uh, rotocraft or vertical lift systems? Sure. Uh, thanks, Andrew. First of all, I'd like to thank, to thank Dave for mentioning the Patriots. You made it we, at least one member of the audience extremely happy. <laughs> um, sure. So that open architecture is is a backbone for what it brings you in terms of capabilities. The uh, the threat and the geopolitical environment are changing much more rapidly than our traditional acquisition processes can keep up with. So we require, and when I say we, it's it's the government industry team, and most importantly, in support of the ultimate warfighter, requires a nimbleness that we just haven't had before. Um, if you take a look at the, the sophistication of rotorcraft, and it wasn't we were talking earlier, it wasn't that long ago that we all started flying, but we started flying on steam gauges with eyeballs, um, with mixing units. Okay, now we've got MFDs backed up by exceptional processing power, very sophisticated sensors, fly-by-wire flight controls. <laughs> all of which make us much more capable, but also much more vulnerable. So that open, secure, uh, open, safe, and secure infrastructure needs to bring you things like cyber resiliency, 
okay, we can't afford to have our aircraft downed for the th sort of things that we sell see unprotected networks or not, not well enough protected networks uh, taken out. Uh, survivability, the threat changes on an almost, uh, almost daily basis, and our acquisition system takes years to, to adjust to that. We need the ability, to, because of that open architecture and an industry that's poised to support that, uh, it takes the entire industry to do that. The level of sophistication you're seeing in Rotocraft today requires the entire industry to be able to, to support that, and that's really why you want that open architecture. You want the government to own those interfaces and the architecture behind it so that they can compete regularly. Uh, a competitive industry stays sharp, stays innovative, and invests because they see a broader, uh, broader range of, uh, of opportunities. I, Rob says he's got the response, so let's hear it. <laughs> you turn off your mic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you nailed it. You know, the idea of getting a backbone in place, um, you know, government guided, but informed by industry. We have a lot of skill in industry, a lot of capability. Let's, let's focus that energy. Let's get this open system. We have to find the appropriate cut line on the aircraft <coughs> where we have the open architecture and that'll, that'll be informed by um, the, the great skills we have out in industry. Now, getting the interface controls right, you know, having the appropriate hardware and software interface controls, and then once you create that, that fertile environment, innovation takes off, and it creates a, a new competitive space where you start to, you know, bring, you start to draw out some of the, uh, the smaller companies, uh, Dave Shrek, you were talking about, draw some of those smaller companies out. If you want to know how to create a good architecture so that the, the units of portability or the, the, the mission gear, um, ask the people who create that stuff, and they will help you understand what the architecture needs to look like. And, and we want to draw that out. So just an unpaid political announcement for the Vertical Lift Consortium. We're responding, the, the, the VLC is going to respond to a task from the government specifically to define those interfaces over the course of about a year and a half. And everybody's on, everybody on the VLC will be able to participate in that. Uh, and it's critical that we have everybody in the supply chain participating because there's a variety. In fact, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2017 outlined a definition of MOSA and the specific interfaces that, should, that, that need to be defined along the way. And they're, they're pretty voluminous, but it's, it's electrical, mechanical, most importantly, signal and data. Um, that will drive what those interfaces look like. And if you have those well-defined interfaces going into the specification that's competed, then long-term, you can upgrade over time, which is exactly where you want to be. You don't want to be in the position of, of, of being locked in any one place. Yeah, so the, the patient capital, but the patient wise capital, you know, we can take a little bit of time and get this right uh, to make sure that moving forward we have those conditions set. And uh, you mentioned it with the, the competition, empowering the market forces. If you try to if you try to design something and drive it from one end, uh, that can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. And you, you tend to suppress some of the innovation. Mm -hmm. If instead you open the aperture and, and make this slate available for others to draw on, you can paint a good picture. I, I think in particularly what you want to do is open up the aperture beyond just the folks you see in the room to small business. When small business start to see a payoff, you'll see a, you'll see a nimbleness and an agility that you don't normally see out of the rest of us and that will force us to adapt. And I, I believe the VLC is doing a good job at that as well. The VLC is driving some of the larger partners, those of us on the table, to actually do certain studies with the smaller, more agile companies. And uh, so we've got, you know, task four, task order four that we're responding to right now. Um, and again, that's, you know, uh, requesting that we look at other smaller OTAs or, or other uh, agencies, smaller companies, um, to hopefully break that shift of, you know, not just being the larger, you know, uh, uh, company that can't uh, be agile enough to move left or right. So hopefully teaming with these other small uh, companies, these industry partners will help achieve that. Here's a concern that I think a lot of us share, and that is that the JMRTD is doing a phenomenal job of helping us look at the implications of what a modular open system architecture can do. We understand that we must be able to integrate third-party content rapidly in the future, especially after the aircraft is initially fielded. So that conversation in technical terms is robust, it's detailed. We're all participating in one way or another. The concern I have is that if, and I'm not a procurement expert, 
or an acquisition expert, but if you look at the DOD 5000 and you look at the FARs and you look at standard DOD ways of doing business, generally the manufacturer becomes a system integrator. Um, and then over time, especially with aircraft and the considerations for airworthiness and the military airworthiness, the rigor of the military airworthiness standards, says that we need to have a more, uh, we need to have a greater discussion with the government about how they intend to execute an acquisition strategy that can complement this going forward. The ability to rapidly integrate capabilities sounds wonderful. It's, it's what we need to do, and, and, and frankly, the government will get that by, by establishing what a modular open system is. But I think we need to begin having the discussion on what impact that has on the life cycle of the aircraft moving forward in terms of not just the practical arrangements about who the integrator is, but the ability to develop uh, business structures with those third party providers, with the OEM, who takes on that role as the integrator. And that conversation I don't think is occurring yet. Um, I'm not sure it can occur necessarily, but it needs to start soon. Um, as third-party providers contact us and they ask some very questions, some of these very basic questions, I'm not sure we can answer them yet. Th these venues are a great way to get started, but this isn't necessarily the government holding these conversations. Is there a possibility that, you know, uh, we need to change, uh, you've, you've raised the possibility, I would suggest, that the approach to airworthiness might need to change to be aligned with this approach to an open mission systems to a, a data architecture that may not look like, you know, the airworthiness approach that was developed, uh, I'm not going to give a time frame because I'll get it wrong, but some decades ago. Thoughts from folks on the panel? I, I think you're exactly right. The, the, there's, uh, and we've already in some, some change in, in the thought processes. I, I think one of the operative words as we go forward is, is collaboration. Uh, I mean, even if you look at standards, uh, look at uh, FACE, uh, Future Airborne Computing Environment, one of the, the more common ones that's, uh, that's being talked about a lot. When that was coming out, within Rockwell Collins, if you got five engineers in a room, there were four or five different interpretations of what that standard was. Uh, that, you know, multiply that across, you know, Northrop's interpretation, Harris's, and all the small companies, and, and you get to Richard's point where, hey, there, there's a, a challenge there, and somebody has to pull all those pieces together. And I think that's where, you know, we've done that historically. Uh, you, know, all, you know, we've been partners to, to Primes for years. Rockwell isn't a, a prime uh, aircraft platform provider. Uh, so we've gotten very good at that, and, and that's got to continue. And actually, it probably needs to, to amp up a bit to be able to hit the, the speed uh, at which we want to sustain the, the ability to address the, the growing threat and the rapidly evolving threat that's out there. Uh, that's something that you hear talked about uh, in, in some circles now. Uh, that's something I think that needs to continue to uh, mature along with the business processes and with the uh, acquisition processes is going to be a key as we go forward. So Dave, something that you touched on is, uh, and Andrew was alluding to it, is who does the subs, who do we go to, right, for future vertical lift, even JMRTD? Do we go to uh, Bell, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, Lock Lockheed Martin, Sikorsky? Do we go to the government? Do we go to both, right? Uh, so the acquisition, uh, just like the, you know, the second question there was, you know, who's gonna, who's gonna run that show? And it's difficult because Every service is going to have their own requirement. You know, is the prime going to meet all of those requirements, or is it going to be channeled down one lane? So, uh, the, the, you know, now is the time to have the discussions on to, you know, who's going to lead this? Is it going to be industry-led? Is it going to be service, you know, DOD-led, a combination thereof? Uh, I do think, again, I, I mentioned it before, the VLC, I, the Army's taking a prominent role in that. Um, you know, so that's kind of the, the building blocks of it. Um, but the second thing I want to add for acquisition portion is, you know, the V-22 is a phenomenal aircraft. I, I was fortunate enough to be there when it uh, deployed in Iraq uh, along with Colonel Freeland. Uh, it, it's a game changer, absolute game changer. The platform is phenomenal. Uh, I enjoyed uh, several missions out of the back of that. I appreciate it. The problem was, 
or is that we're facing now is, you know, that 30-year-old technology, even though, you know, deployed in the mid-2000s, you know, the avionics in it is, you know, was ultimately developed also in the early 90s. And here we are 20, 25 years later, and, uh, and we know that there's phenomenal capability that we can inject into the platform. It's just difficult to do that. And like I mentioned during my initial question, it's the architecture, the design, the ICDs. Um, those, it just wasn't open at that time. And that's all right. I mean, that's where we were when it was developed. But we know now that, you know, even if the airframe is uh, fields approximately 2030, et cetera, you know, we, we can't pigeonhole the avionics architecture, the mission equipment package now. We have to build a design architecture that will allow the most advanced, advanced equipment in 2030. We need to be able to inject it at that time of fielding. Just one comment from the, uh, from the air vehicle side related to all this discussion. I think it's fantastic. Um, so a lot of discussion about uh, getting the architecture right, uh, understanding what are the, the subsystems, what are the interfaces, and, and how, do you, how do you get that right. <clears throat> and I think it's really important as a community that we, we face into and know that uh, as from a mission equipment package perspective that hardware will become obsolete, software will have to be upgraded. So you, the equivalent for us is on the air vehicle side is we have a, a flying air vehicle that basically has multiple, the, the corollary is, you know, USB ports, so that you know that you're going to have to change these things out. You know that the threat is going to evolve. There are unknown unknowns of uh, survivability equipment that are gonna have to be created and built, that are gonna have to be plugged into the aircraft that the aircraft can recognize, uh, and that is going to continue to evolve over time. So I think it's important that we don't get so hung up on the fact that we've gotta get this, uh, this thing completely right and know everything that we're gonna have to put into it. It's more about getting the interfaces right, getting the backbone right, so that you can continue to bring uh, new hardware and software to the platform, have it modular like we talked about, so that you can put it in, aircraft recognizes it, you work through the airworthiness process so that you can do that and, 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 uh, and not bog down. Um, additionally, we've seen hardware just what, how big was a Link 16 box in an aircraft years ago? And then you continue to get better technology where you bring the swap down of all of these components and you bring the swap down for capabilities. So that is an enormous opportunity as well, is taking something out just because it's too heavy and it has evolved and you can get the same capability, bring that in, bring in additional capabilities because otherwise you keep eating away at the payload of the aircraft. And that's what we've seen with vertical lift aircraft in particular is you continue to you know eat into that margin. So. Getting that backbone right, having it like a, a USB where your PC recognizes something, it comes on, uh, that, that's what we need to get to, but we shouldn't let that paralyze us in terms of when we move forward. Let's get the backbone right and let's move forward. The air vehicles, they're around for 50, 75, they're around for a really long time, so getting the backbone right so that we can plug in new systems and deal with these unknown unknowns that are out there over time is, is I think is really important. I, I think Keith's right. There we, we, there's been some talk of a separate mission equipment package, and I think what we're really driving towards is a separable components of a mission equipment package so that in, on, the, on the life cycle throughout the, I mean, you take a look at these components uh, and mission equipment uh, turnover every two to five years, and in some cases, uh, software is even more frequent than that. Um, there certainly are things inherent in the design of an aircraft uh, that you don't want to, uh, to put in jeopardy uh, with, uh, with interfaces that aren't properly defined, those things are inherent in what an aircraft manufacturer does, how the aircraft flies, how things interoperate on the platform. I think what we're looking for is uh, in the life cycle of the aircraft for the, the government to have the ability to take advantage of, the, of those rapid upgrades and mission equipment that are going to happen uh, by an energized industry because there's a competitive environment. There, there are arguably two areas where I think you need to take special concern in thinking of the air vehicle as separable from the mission system especially going forward. One of those areas is the survivability of the aircraft. Um, if we desire to put multi-spectral sensors on an aircraft that can deal with some of the advanced degraded visual environment conditions, uh, nobody in this room would disagree that that's one of the most important goals of future aircraft is making them more survivable in, in degraded visual environments. Then your sensors 
perform not just mission equipment roles, but they could arguably also be used for pilotage, which directly then links back into flight controls, um, back to the performance of the air vehicles. Um, that's not so easily separable. Um, and so we have to think deeply about if we, if we view our sensor packages and the inputs it provides to pilot vision, especially heads-up displays and so forth, then you're, you're sort of getting back into an area where it's not so easy to simply swap out a new sensor in a, in a USB port setting, if we want to use that analogy. Um, I thought it was a good one. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> um, and so the, the other area, well, I actually hit them both. It's really uh, survivability and pilotage are the two areas that we've got to be very cautious in how we view the integration and mission system components. Yes, this has been great because it starts to drag out the different perspectives and that's exactly the dialogue we were hoping would occur here and that's also the dialogue that um, on a very technical uh, level should be occurring in the mission systems architecture demonstration, the, kind of the second phase of the JMR tech demonstrators, uh, which, you know, that's, that competition's already underway. Um, that's good. But it raises the good points. Uh, we have return on investment considerations that come into play because if you change the integration, I'll go ahead and say change integration relationship, then that changes the way that some of the primes, you know, get a return on investment. We gotta think that through. We also need to think through intellectual property. That's a, a big discussion. Section 813's been working on that since uh, the 216, uh, uh, 2016 NDAA. Uh, that's all underway. So the mission system architecture architecture demonstration, which is industry, a whole bunch of folks from industry coming in and having the conversation with government, we can do this, we can do that, here's how we can structure it. That's going to tell us a lot of how we can do things from a technical standpoint. I think we do have a challenge that we need to come back and figure out, you know, we've got law on one side saying now a modularized open system architecture is the way you're going. Okay. So in the middle, we've got to get the regulation right. Uh, to, to open up um, that, that, that ability. And, and that's work that still needs to be done. I will tell you the conversations are occurring. Uh, there are a lot of folks working on how we're going to do that. And so I don't get my head chopped off and put in a bag. I'll just not go into how I think this is gonna go, but we will, uh, uh, we're gonna have to take all that into account. So the continuing dialogue with industry to understand where there's opportunity, where there's also hazard, is uh, what's gonna have to happen. I did have one other moderator question that I think Keith may have subtly already undermined, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and then he can, he can elaborate. But it, it, it gets to the, you know, how close are we? How close are we to having this data architecture, this backbone uh, defined? And I say Keith undermined it because he kind of implied that there is no, like, single point answer that you get there and we're there and we're done and it's got the great backbone and everything's going to work. Uh, but, but how close are we at least to having, you know, the, the structure that we need to to move forward, uh, you know, to let, you know, the Harris's, the Rockwell's, the Northrop's, and others really get deep into their design process on the mission systems. And I'm, so I, I, oh, I think it's going to me, I'm sorry. So I mentioned the, uh, the VLC task to define interfaces, and that, that, that to me is, is the most critical one, uh, because the architecture itself is going to take some time to evolve and experiment with. So. Uh, we, a, a number of companies in the room uh, participated in something called the Architectural Impl Implementation Process Demonstration as part of MSAT, uh, and that was about a year-long study um, that just concluded. In fact, we briefed it out to each other. In fact, it was a very collaborative environment. All of us briefed our results and lessons learned to the other participants in, in Huntsville at the beginning of the month. Uh, it's going to be followed up by the capstone demonstration that's going to be about two years. It's going to bid starting at the, uh, in this fall and probably conclude about uh, 30 months later. I don't think you can wait for that to be done to move forward with FVL as long as you define the interfaces that allow the architecture on, on the mission, mission equipment side to evolve while you're moving forward on the aircraft. So that, that, architect, that, that definition of interfaces is, is the critical aspect of this, uh, that if you don't get that right, um, that architecture will end up owning you for the next 40 years. So, so in, this, in the new paradigm, if you, if you start to look at um, you know, risks and where they're getting burned down and where they remain, um, that's going to be difficult, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And there's a lot of energy going in that direction. Um, but you look at what we're getting out of these joint multi-role tech demonstrators, you know, the, um, the two-thirds investment from industry, the one-third investment from the government, 
you know, you start to burn down some of the risks that you've had traditionally, some risks in production, some risks in the ability to rapidly iterate with some of these new designs, because let's face it, like you said, from the reliability and maintainability, we have got to characterize the uh, vibratory, thermal, and acoustic environment of those airframes, and then, if necessary, tweak the, uh, the subsystems to make sure they can live in that environment. That oftentimes has taken, um, has presented a time and money challenge, well, with some of the risk that has been driven down, um, digital threads and otherwise, uh, we were in a position to get that done early and focus some of this, uh, the capital on solving these other problems of getting the architecture right. And then we end up with what we want for the future, which is a highly reliable, maintainable aircraft, the ability to rapidly assimilate new technologies to face the threat and to uh, provide different mission system capabilities such as the, uh, you know, the pilotage you mentioned, Rich. Uh, and that's, that's where we can get if we do this properly. I'd also point out that, that the government's already started investing in open architecture, in, uh, in survivability, integrated survivability equipment, communications, and, and cockpits. Um, I would, I'd encourage us all to take, take a look at some of the lessons there and how that's worked uh, for the government because you don't want to start this thing in a big bang approach on future vertical lift. You'd like to do it on legacy aircraft and grow it into future vertical lift because quite frankly, the, the, the risk, uh, the acquisition risk in developing FVL is all going to be in speed range and payload. Okay, you're, you're developing new airfoils using new engines um, and new control surfaces. That's where all your acquisition risk is going to be. You don't want any of your risk to be, in, to be in the mission equipment package itself. You want to mature those capabilities in the legacy, legacy fleet and have them buy their way onto FVL so that it's not a, you know, the only thing you're dealing with is integrating, not developing. I would argue, Andrew, that we're, we're probably already partly there and we have some experience. If you look at what Sikorsky and before the acquisition uh, by Lockheed Martin when Lockheed was collaborating with Sikorsky on the Navy MH-60 Romeo Sierra program, you know, we, we implemented a, a, a way of taking the Army or the Navy's seven plus, I think it was seven variants of naval helicopters into two variants, but they share a common mission computer. Um, they share a common software drop and the Navy has disciplined themselves to a yearly software upgrade of that system. Um, and the quick integration of mission, uh, mission equipment capabilities onto that aircraft. And so you can take the mission computer from any one of those platforms, put it in another, it'll serve the same, permise, uh, same purpose. So we have quite a bit of experience in implementing some of that open systems architecture already, and it's flying in some aircraft today. I want to open up now to audience questions. We've gone on for a little while, more than I intended, but it's been a great uh, back and forth and discussion. Uh, I'm here in the front. Hi, George Nicholson, uh, Washington Liaison for the Global Special Operations Forces Foundation. I did the requirements, the lead analyst for the V-22 for SOCOM. I did it for the uh, lead aviation analyst for the Global uh, Personnel Recovery uh, Operation. Uh, a few years ago, Congressman Gene Taylor, when he was chairman of the subcommittee for sea power and expeditionary war at the uh, Surface Navy Association, started off his keynote speech, as much as we're paying for an aircraft, as much as we're paying for a ship, it's got to have a growth capability in it. Uh, you've talked about plug and play and everything else, but in terms of looking at the future, and he said, that's the first question I'm going to ask if it comes before my committee. Well, you know, he was, he was defeated. But in terms of things like directed energy weapons coming on board. Are you going to have the generators that are going to be able to provide that additional generator power? Are you going to have the space and everything else? Is that being looked at, uh, uh, looking at, you know, I'm going to have a growth capability on the platform? So there are a lot of options on the table for the mission systems associated. Uh, and survivability systems associated. I, I will tell you that uh, the focus right now is making sure we get the backbone right, get the interfaces right, so we can iterate um, some of these different systems you bring on board. Uh, that comes into play, the different uh, generation of different types of power on the aircraft, um, that it's all in discussion. Uh, but the focus is on getting the infrastructure right so that we can, uh, we can create this, this, this new competitive space and this new innovative space. Um, all of the advanced technologies that will be available, we want to be able to port them in. And uh, absolutely, 
you're thinking through the space, weight, and power of the swap that was articulated earlier, and cooling. You know, making sure you can do that kind of thing. Uh, but specific devices, we haven't nailed down what that's going to be. Thank you. Uh, Sandra Irwin, I'm a reporter with Real Clear Defense. I have a question about the um, rotary aviation industrial base, kind of broadly speaking. Um, the uh, administration is now going to be studying the state of the defense industrial base, and when you have a program like Future Vertical Lift that's not going to be in production for like 20 years, what does what would be the implications for the industrial base? Do you foresee that potentially there would not be um, production for a while and that would undermine uh, potentially having a healthy industrial base when you have to get ready to produce new helicopters? I just wanted your thoughts maybe from the industry and the government perspective. Thanks. I think it's a significant issue. Um, that's a great question. Uh, we uh, talk about Bell Helicopter, so we, uh, aircraft company, we have a commercial business and we have a military business, so we have some opportunities there related to our uh, uh, engineering base, manufacturing base, uh, that we that we uh, are able to trade back and forth. Um, that said, uh, we are a tilt rotor company. Uh, we make V-22 along with uh, Boeing, and you know, tilt rotor is our uh, our our technology, uh, the current pace of JMR and FEL and how that relates and how we bridge uh, our workforce with our, given our current products um, to wherever uh, the milestones land for FEL is a, is a significant concern. Um, you also look at uh, the, the, the talent base within, within DOD, pick any of these companies, and then the other draw from that talent to, to other industries. and and a, uh, a generation that's coming up that, that wants to make an impact very quickly, aircraft and mission equipment, these kind of things, they take uh, a lot of time. So, so keeping, uh, acquiring the right kind of talent, retaining the talent within this, uh, this industrial base is a significant challenge, I believe, for all of us as we, as we go forward. So the, the, the timing of this and the resources, uh, the, the talent is, is right there with it in, in terms of the industrial, uh, industrial base on the people as well as the, uh, the facilities and the, the capabilities to, to uh, design and produce these aircraft. If you look historically, too, uh, I mean, the defense industrial base has been looked at several times uh, throughout history in different uh, venues also, and the shipbuilding was one there was a lot of concern about before. And I think that's where a lot of the standards based and the open architecture really plays into it, because if, if you know, whether it's bringing the, the prime, the, the air vehicle platform or the mission equipment packages, if folks out there don't see an ability to uh, actually invest and then recoup their investment later on with some actual hardware, software, platforms that go out the door, then those small companies, the large companies, they'll all do the same thing. They'll say that we aren't going to do that anymore. We're going to invest the, the sparse you know, research and development funds that we have, and the government will do the same thing in, in areas that they can get a payback, a return on investment, and that's when you have a shrinking industrial base, and that's where I think the open architecture really starts to turn that around and starts to tell people, hey, make your investment, look at your innovative technologies, bring those forward, help us meet the growing threat that's out there. If I, if I could, I'm sorry. The, uh I wouldn't presuppose that it's 20 years until we start seeing production uh, on these aircraft. Uh, we've been pretty open that it's probably in the late 20s, but we have to wait to see. We have to evaluate what comes out of JMRT. We've learned a lot already. We've seen where industry, the partners have driven down some of the risk for production within uh, with their own processes, and that's very, very important. Um, so I, I don't presuppose an acquisition strategy either. Uh, you know, we're being careful. We're having uh, good discussions and analysis with DCMA, looking at the fragility of the uh, the industrial base and making sure that we don't make decisions that imperil folks. Uh, plus, you have to keep in mind that if we do take the time uh, to get the reliability and maintainability right up front and we get the backbone right up front, that just blows the doors wide open for uh, foreign military sales and commercial application. So we're, again, patient and wise capital. We can, we can take the right time to get it done. Okay. 
Thank you. Hi, Lee Jung Greco. I'm a reporter with Flight Global. Um, David, this is a question for you, but suppose anyone on the panel could answer it. Um, you had mentioned kind of driving down the risk and the actual structure of the aircraft, uh, the blades and that sort of thing. But I'm wondering, um, is there anything that you can do on this program, um, suppose actually, Colonel, this is a question for you, to speed up um, the acquisition process as far as the structure goes? And then I'm sure Northrop would love to do something like what you did with the um, Limas, just sort of, you know, going forward if you had an older mission system and then you could just convert it to something newer rather than trying to get the backbone in now and taking so much time up front. So I think the reason that we're so uh, interested in open architecture um, is because of how it opens up the market uh, and how it, uh, how it, it causes more competition. Um, essentially, uh, to paraphrase a Christopher McDougall book, uh, it doesn't matter if you're the lion or the gazelle when the sun comes up, you better be running. The behavior that the government wants out of industry is that we're running. Uh, and, and if you have a competitive industry, that's what you get. Um, if, you have, if, if, you don't get the, if you're not getting that behavior, it's because things are settled. And you don't want things always settled. You want co uh, competition. So in, in, the, in the vein of uh, what can we do interim, um, and that's, as we upgrade mission systems on legacy aircraft, and legacy aircraft are going to be around for decades, literally decades. We're going to be flying Blackhawks, Apaches, and V-22s 30 or 40 years from now. Um, as you do that, if you open up the interfaces, you open up the competition to, to the rest of industry, that's going to spark innovation. That's going to spark an, an investment. As, as industry sees that, uh, they'll be able to, uh, if they see opportunity, they'll invest. Um, and that's where you get innovation, and that's where you get the things to mature it most quickly, I think. Does that answer your question? Yeah, a little bit. I guess um, my question was just more, um, I, thank you, sorry. I suppose um, Northrop, in a way, already disrupted uh, what was going on with the Blackhawk, because, sure. yeah, I mean, it wasn't a lock for Sikorsky there, so couldn't you do that in the future? <coughs> and not just Northrop, but anyone could, you know, disrupt the uh, mission system. Uh, segment there. So speaking to the, uh, to the, to the uh, what, what can we do from an acquisition practice perspective, the reason that there was a competition for that was the Army took a risk in, in, in how they were going to maintain their aircraft. Uh, they took a risk looking for life cycle costs, looking for something innovative. Uh, and, they, and they got that. They got a couple of really good bids. And we were very fortunate. Um, so I would say that every time you have, have the opportunity to open up a competition um, and, and not just go back to uh, the way you've been doing business for a while, it's going to spark innovation across the industry. But that way of doing it is not the, it's more the exception rather than the rule. So. And, and you'll, have to say, you'll have to take a look at the lessons learned, how well that works out. Um, that the idea there is that, is that uh, is the, the government owns that um, and, and is able to compete it. Rob? Hi. So the other part of it is uh, don't try to get it perfect right now. If you try to get all the different Christmas lights that are going to be on this aircraft eventually, uh, lasers and otherwise, you know, it, it, it might take you some time to get all that stuff right. We, if we get the reliability and maintainability of the air vehicles right and we get the backbone right, then we can iterate some of the other stuff. We just have to recognize what needs to be done up front. And that's where the analysis or the evaluation of what we learn from the joint multi-role tech demonstrators is going to tell us what's going to have to happen during the tech maturation risk reduction phase that we do believe is going to be in place. Um, and that will set us up uh, for the success in the future without taking too long. It's when people try to make it perfect that things start falling apart. Yeah, hi, uh, James Drew from Aviation Week. Um, I'm wondering just from the panel, uh, what, what's uh, all of your opinions on who should be the prime system integrator for this uh, future vertical lift uh, family of air vehicles? Is that a role for the government or are we still gonna have the prime contractors leading that? Or does someone like Northrop wanna see that shopped out? Thank you. So if I could, uh that's the discussion we were having about uh, trying to figure out 
the, the appropriate cut line on the aircraft. Uh, there may be some things that fall back into a traditional integrator role on the aircraft there, but there's a cut line in the aircraft where we, we have to be able to rapidly uh, iterate the mission systems and the survivability systems. So that's all part of the mission system architecture demonstration. That's all part of the dialogue. That's all part of um, you know, responding to laws in place now and what we need to do for regulation to uh, figure out who's holding the bag at the appropriate time. It'd be, it'd be prejudicial to try to tell you who's going to do that now because we haven't done enough, enough of the evaluation. I was just going to give the short answer, Sikorsky Boeing, but. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, airframes will take five to seven to eight years to develop from the time you snap the chalk line and, and award a contract to the time you're flying. If you get those interfaces right up front, you can move at those two paces and have them be disconnected and have, and have them plug in later. If you don't get those interfaces right up front, you'll end up owning uh, or, or being owned by those interfaces and being locked into a certain way of doing business. And, and the way we want, we, we want to be more rapid and nimble and open things up to a competitive industry. Um, and that the way to do that is to have those interfaces defined by the entire industry and owned by the government. And I think a way to answer that also is to put the, the, the question in context with, with the mistakes that have been made in the past, you know, what things have gotten in the way in the past. If you get all the way to an EMD phase past your milestone B, you, you're, you're pretty much stuck with that, that configuration. So let's see what we have from joint multi-role. Let's see how we can, you know, those are demonstrators, and they're, they're fantastic for what they're doing and, and for what they're demonstrating and some of the improvements that they've driven into the manufacturers, the, the readiness for production, all those kinds of things, this workforce that's primed, ready to go. Okay, now what do we need to do to actually turn those things into prototypes? So we, we have to get survivability right. We, we want to characterize and then take the time to get reliability and maintainability right. And we've got to get the backbone in place with the appropriate interface controls. So those are the things that you want to do up front. Otherwise, you start to gain so much inertia uh, that you have to try to overcome that you end up stuck with something and that you end up with a systems like some of the, the very effective systems we have today but are really expensive to maintain the life cycle and that's not what we want. We want to take the next step and we can do it. We, we understand that we just have to get the conditions in place. I'd like to take a quick swing at it myself. I, we can't kid ourselves that our, our government is not in a very tough budgetary environment that what has occurred over the past couple of years in terms of the Budget Control Act sequestration um, have given the government, you know, somewhat limited flexibility in how they deal with modernization and fielding new systems going forward. And that environment is probably not going to ease up for a handful of years. So, Colonel Freeland, your masters um, in some parts of OSD are going to ask you some very tough questions about whether or not the bang is, is worth the buck. Um, and so I think it's absolutely critical that we as industry demonstrate to the government that we are bringing a significant change to capability. But at the same time, we're doing it affordably, and we're doing it at a way that doesn't expose the government to undue risk in terms of procurement and tech development. So there are a lot of stretch goals for this program, but I think the first and, and foremost goal is to demonstrate the value is there given the risk and, and the money the government is going to have to put into this program. We've invested, all of us have invested, Keith has mentioned it, a significant amount of money in, in these technologies. And we are confident that we're going to demonstrate, and I'm sure Keith is confident that he's going to demonstrate some of those same uh, capabilities. Um, but we've got to do it in a way that is realistic. And I believe that government is going to be somewhat cynical about our ability to do that if we can't show them where those benefits, where that cost-benefit analysis is up front. So it's interesting that, uh, that really I, I see as much value in, you know, th there's a lot of value being demonstrated in what, and, you know, all, all the pieces, all the, all the technical capabilities, whether it's air vehicle or mission equipment packages. Uh, what, what's really interesting is that, the, you know, the debate, the discussion we're having here today is, is how is this going to be done? And I think that's still going to play out in a, in a big way over the coming months and years. Uh, it's just good from, from I think, uh, you know, from comments made across the entire panel that uh, the government, that industry is looking in that direction, that we're actually taking steps with open system architectures. You know, that wasn't new with FEL. That was something that started before to some of David's comments before. We need to continue to mature those processes and continue to refine those so we can, you know, back to what I said at the very beginning, we have to meet the mission needs of our customers. You know, our, our, our livelihood, you know, what, what we want to do, you know, how, how folks are out there on the pointy end of the spear defending the nation, we owe it to them to figure it out. It, it's a tough problem, they're, they're, and they're point and counterpoint on, on both sides. Uh, but it's something we have to figure out. And I think there are a lot of, you know, I know Rockwell and every, you know, we had a pre-meeting uh, here before this. Every company up here and many others that aren't here are, are dedicated to being able to make that happen. And just to, to, to touch on what uh, Rich was talking about just for a moment, um, a sophisticated goal discussion is required. 
um, if it is a reliable and maintainable advanced uh, vertical lift platform uh, that has the ability to rapidly assimilate new technologies, if that's what you're after, that doesn't equal fast and cheap. So when, when people are saying, uh, if they're just pulling levers of, hey, go faster and hey, make it uh, cheaper, okay, that, that's not going to bring you the product you're looking for. So it, it, an open and, and intelligent discussion about what is it we're really after? Can we do it? These tech demonstrations are showing us all that we can do. Okay, let's take the time to get it right and make sure we don't make it so long that we have um, uh, you know, industrial-based issues and then find the appropriate um, snap of the chalk line to, to move forward. We can do that and just can't be afraid of the discussion. Well, uh, we've gone a little over our time, so I apologize. I was going to try and fit in another question, but we had so much goodness to, to get from the panel that I think we're going to have to, as uh, the Colonel said, snap the chalk line here on this event. Uh, and uh, I want to thank the, the audience for coming. This has been a, a great discussion, and please join me in thanking the panel.